It is indeed almost that time of year when we will awaken from our I was going to say long, but I know it seems brief, doesn't it? Brief, brief summer slumber. Uh, you know, they say uh, nothing of significance happens on this campus during July. Uh, that is true. Uh, we all sleep, we go dormant, a little bit like uh, maybe Chris's uh, uh, children's story, we kind of burrow for a bit and uh, get out of the sun, get out of the race for a bit, and then after we have regained some strength, we come back and in just a matter of days, our campus will once again have an inordinate number of people that are young and bring energy and enthusiasm to our campus. And I thought it might be helpful as we look forward to that, that we answer a question. Can you remember a time when someone passed a mantle on to you? Now you understand the question, right? I, I don't mean the wood that's over your fireplace. I'm not referring to a time when someone took a piece of the earth's crust and gave it to you. I'm talking instead about when someone has passed a mantle of a different sort onto you. Uh, the symbolism comes uh, from long, long ago, way, way back in history, thousands of years in fact, people would wear a mantle, a cloak, a cape we might call it today, Usually it would tie, get somehow connect at the neck, and, and there were no sleeves, but often it went all the way down to almost to one's feet. And, and this cape, this mantle, for certain professions became a symbol of their calling to that profession. A symbol of authority, uh, of responsibility, of a certain measure of knowledge or of skill or of blessing, whatever it might be. That mantle meant something. And so the saying came about, did you pass the mantle on? Usually we're talking about the next generation. Have you passed responsibility, this sense of calling, this, this body of knowledge and wisdom, etc.? Has that been passed on? Can you think of a time when someone passed a mantle on to you? You know, I can think of, of two small but significant times when that happened to me. There, there are many others, but, but, but two come to mind. The first is when I was 14 years old. I was working for a few weeks on my grandparents' farm in Oklahoma, and Grandpa Fisher came to me and he said, hey, listen, we've got all of our stuff covered, uh, but there is one job that I really need to get done, and I need someone to do it, and I think you're the guy. And he said, there's a pasture that's at the far end it's got a, of our property. It's got a whole bunch of trees on it, many, many acres. He said, we want to turn that into a place that we can plant crops eventually. I need you to take the Jeep, and I need you to take this five-gallon bucket of poison pills and put three or four of those, po this, this is pre-green days, okay, this is the old days, all right, and put three or four of these pills at the base of each one of those trees, and they'll die off, and in a couple of years we'll be able to make this something that we can use for crops. I'll tell you what, to have the keys to a Jeep and a bucket of poison is every 14-year-old boy's dream. <laughs> I mean, this was awesome. You know, I mean, he, he had already, you know, he knew that I could, could drive. That started two years earlier. And so he knew I could do that. And so he gave me some basic instructions here about the poisons, how to handle it, gloves, etc., whatever. And as I drove off from the main farm compound there out to my assignment, my, my, my buttons were just popping. I had been mantled in just this little bit here, and it felt great. I had been given responsibility, a modicum of training. Now they said, you go use it. second time I can remember is when I was probably about 17 years old. I had a very fresh driver's license in my wallet. And I had gotten a job, a summer job, working for uh, one of the professors at Oklahoma State University, actually at his private home there. A uh, fairly good sized home, decent estate there. There was a, quite a bit of construction, remodeling, etc., that he wanted to have done. And I was the gopher. I was the grunt, right? And so it was a job. I was taking it, but I needed to have a way to get there. And so when it finally came the day before, uh, I'm talking uh, with my dad and say, well, you know, how, how do I get there? Are you going to drop me off on your way to work? He said, well, it's not exactly on the way. Tell you what, why don't you take the Healy. And I knew he didn't mean the race car, because the race car wasn't street legal. I, was, I wasn't going to be able to take that. It was about a 20-minute drive to this professor's house. 
I knew that he meant the 1952 Austin Healey 104 that was in the garage. Now, now uh, I'm sure you all know about British sports cars, right? I mean, duh, everybody does, correct? Uh, so I'm just going to tell you what you already know. 1952 for that particular model is almost unheard of. Very, very few were made during that year. 1953 is when things really picked up. Today, if, if we still had the car in the family, we don't, but if we did, uh, 100 grand piece of cake for one of those cars. And uh, Dad said, why don't you take the Healy? Now I'm thinking over in my head, and the last thing you want to do is ask any questions. You just nod and say, I think that's a good idea, Dad. Let's do that, right? And so for the, whatever it was, three weeks, four weeks maybe, that I worked at that professor's house there, every morning I would get into the Healy, and I'd fire it up, and I would drive 20 minutes there, and drive 20 minutes back. The best part of the job was going to it and leaving it. I mean, it was incredible. I, as I would drive away uh, through traffic on the highway, you know, your dad had taught me how to take care of the thing. I knew how to take care of classic cars, right? How to work on them, etc. If something broke down, he knew I would take care of it. And to prove the point, he handed me those keys and said, You take it. And both of those stories have in common a basic set of beliefs on the part of the ones granting this gift. They were saying, we've given you a bit of training. Now we're going to have you put it to use. There is some risk, but we think you can do it. And they passed a bit of a mantle onto me. And I was blessed. Those are some of my more fond memories from my childhood growing up. And if it's true for Jeeps and British sports cars, how much more true is it for spiritual things, things that really matter for eternity? In fact, I want to suggest to you that passing the mantle of faith on to the next generation is one of the most important and gratifying and satisfying things that can be done. In fact, this is why we voted something last year. You may remember this. Let me put it up on the screen here. We, there's three levels to our vision. This is the one that's closest to home here. And would you just read this with me here? Level one of our vision for this church, God's vision for this church is, we do cross-generational ministry in such a way that we grow lifelong disciples of Christ and have a baptism every month. Now I want the other half of you to join in as we read this all together. Ready? We do cross-generational ministry in such a way that we grow lifelong disciples of Christ and have a baptism every month. You know, most Christian churches have this part right here, this idea of uh, growing lifelong disciples of Christ. They'll take Matthew 28 and they'll say, this is what we're about. If we're going to be Christian, we need to be making disciples for Jesus. We get all that. Very, very few but specifically in, we believe God's vision for this church, foundational level, level one, is that we do that discipleship ministry cross-generationally that we take those who are older and put them intentionally with those who are younger and every generation in between, that we will not have a, an unofficial caste system in which one group is more important than another. We're not going to say, hey, youth ministry, that's what we're all about. All of you that are older, you can just forget your place. We're not going to say, for all those of you that are older, this is all for you, never mind what the youngins want. Instead, we have said, we are all God's children. All generations belong to the Lord. And we ought to be working together that maximum discipleship might take place. And implicit in this statement is the idea of passing the mantle on to the next generation. Now don't misunderstand. I'm not saying here, this, again, this is not a hierarchy. But it is nonetheless true that someone who has been longer in the faith ought to have something they can pass on to someone who, who is younger in the faith. If someone is older and they've been around that discipleship track a few more times than someone else, they ought to have something that they can pass on to someone who hasn't been around the track that many times. And by the way, this is not something that is reserved for those that are 60, 70, 80, 90 years old. If you're in high school and you've been a Christian for six years, you probably have something more about Jesus Christ in your particular life account than, say, a second grader or a third grader does. And I want to suggest to you that God calls you to pass the mantle that's been given to you also on even in that young 
scenario that I just described. This is not something that God has said, if you have time, do it. If you feel like it, do it. This instead is something where God has made it clear in his word over and over and over again that any Christian who has greater experience needs to be passing on that mantle of faith to anyone of smaller experience. That's just the way the kingdom is to work. And some of you might be wondering why. What happens when you do that? Turn in your Bibles, please, to 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 1. 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 1. It's on page 260 in the blue Bible in the back of the pew in front of you there, page 260. 2 Kings chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. What can happen when God's people take seriously the responsibility to pass the mantle of faith, the mantle of ministry on to the next generation? The story that we're going to read here is one of the more famous stories in all of the Bible. We're going to read about two men. first one's named Elijah, and the second one is named Elisha. Now, Elijah was, quite simply, one of the greatest prophets that has ever lived. Uh, Old Testament, New Testament, throughout history, doesn't matter. Elijah comes near the top of any particular list that, that has to do with, who, you know, how did the Lord work mightily through a single person? Elijah's right there. He lived, he started his ministry during a time of extensive apostasy in Israel. Uh, the worshiping of idols, I mean, even, even to the terrible extent of, of sacrificing children uh, to uh, the gods in fire. It was, it was a terrible mess, and that's what Elijah was called into. He was not able to eradicate things completely, but by the grace of God and a lot of hard work, he made a profound impact on the nation of Israel. And here, where we're going to read, we're almost near the end of Elijah's ministry. In fact, very near the end of his ministry. His young protege, his understudy, Elisha, is with him. Been with him now for a few years. And let's see what happens. Verse 1. And it came to pass, when the Lord was about to take Elijah up into heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Then Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. Pause for just a moment, please. As we're going to see in just a moment, Elisha has already been informed by God that Elijah is on his way, not out, but up. And it's very clear that, that Elisha is well aware of this. You'll see in just a moment that others are also aware of this. We don't actually know that Elijah is aware that other people know. In fact, that may explain the repetition that we're going to see of, of asking Elisha to stay put. Elisha knows, and he will not leave his mentor's side for one second. You see, for many years now, we don't know exactly how many, it hasn't been decades, but it's been years, Elisha has been sitting at the feet of Elijah, and he's becoming his spiritual father in the faith. I mean, the connection between them, as we're going to see here, is strong. And so there's no way, there's not, there's not a moment, lest somehow, with Elisha's looking this way, that God takes Elijah away that way. He wants to hear every last word from his mentor's lips. Let the lesson be clear. There are so many adults who think that young people don't want to hear anything they have to say. Many of them, they, they, they just completely check out. Adults, they check out from any sort of, of you know, passing the mantle on, developing relationships with younger people because they say, yeah, what, I'm, I'm old. You know, I, I, live, I came from a different generation. We don't speak the same language. We have a different culture. How could I possibly bridge the gap? You know, there are a handful of young people that that is true for. I mean, let's be honest, it's true. There are some young people that don't want to hear what you have to say. That's true. 
But I want to suggest to you that particularly on this campus, they are in the minority. And if you are willing to take the time to be open, to establish a relationship with them, my guess is you will be surprised at how appreciative they are when you share your life experience with the Lord with them. You know, the fact of the matter is, we, uh, those of you that used to be teenagers, for instance, those of you that are teens, we love you. Just listen in. We're going to tell you some secrets here in just a moment, right? But those of you that can remember when you were, as you look back, the projection that you gave of knowing everything, you know it wasn't true, didn't you? In fact, there were times when you were a teenager that you craved having somebody that was older and wiser that would listen to you and your concerns and give you some help. You know that's true, don't you? That, that's the way that I find it to be true for almost every teen that I know. And when you take the time and you come alongside them and you begin that mantling process, maybe in small ways, maybe in big ways, maybe it's an informal thing, maybe it's formal, you have this ongoing uh, mentoring relationship, you need to know that the preciousness that's reflect, reflected here in this relationship between Elisha and Elijah just might be yours too. There are people on this campus this coming school year that need an Elijah. And I want to suggest that Elijah just might be you. Verse 3. Now the sons of the prophets who were at Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Then Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Jericho. But he said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. Now the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho came to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? So he answered, Yes, I know. Keep silent. And by the way, in the Hebrew, uh, phonetically, the word there for keep silent sounds a great deal like our English word hush. I can't say that there's a direct connection, but be assured, Elisha is a little bit irritated and said, would you guys just shut up? <laughs> I know what's happening. I know. He's leaving. Hush, hush. Then Elijah said to him, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to the Jordan. But he said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. And fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood facing them at a distance while the two of them stood by the Jordan. Now, Elijah took his mantle, his mantle, rolled it up and struck the water. And it was divided this way and that so that the two of them crossed over on dry ground. <laughs> now, I tell you what. We are at such a distance chronologically from this story, and in many ways culturally, that it's easy to get distracted by the miracle. And I don't want to belittle it. I mean, it, it is miraculous. I've never done this. You know, I, I've never been able to go even to the bathtub and say, be divided, and it does. I, I can't do that. And so, yes, it is impressive. They strike the water with the mantle, and phew, everything rolls up, and apparently it even dries stuff out. It's dry land that they go across here. Yes, impressive. And most emphatically, not the point. Elisha, however, must have seen the significance of what has just happened. Because years earlier, there were some other Jews, some other children of Israel, that came to a body of water that was impassable. And at that time, a different prophet, not with a mantle this time, but with a rod, stretched it out over that body of water. And indeed, by the power of God, the winds came, and it separated the Red Sea. And the children of God walked through on dry ground with the intent being that they were that close to entering the promised land. Elisha, as a student of the word, and a prophet of God could not have missed the significance. He already knows that his master Elijah is going to be taken very soon. They have just crossed the Jordan. The promised land must lie just on the other side for Elijah. And at this point, 
This is a little bit of my sanctified imagination here. You be the judge of whether or not it's correct. I think what, because of what comes next, I think it's correct. I think Elisha gets a little bit agitated. Have you ever had to be at a place where you're saying goodbye to somebody that you do not want to say goodbye to? And you know the feelings that come over you? Maybe, you know, I think Elisha is thinking, oh, it's going to happen. It's going to happen any time now. What, 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 what can I say? Can he, is, there some, is there some blessing that he can give to me? Is there something I should ask him about? I'm not going to be able to do this anymore. In just a, a short time, we're almost there. Can I get something, one last thing, from my spiritual father in the faith? And perhaps seeing Elisha's agitation, Elijah breaks in. Verse 9, And so it was when they had crossed over that Elijah said to Elisha, Ask, what may I do for you before I am taken away from you? Elisha, who has now apparently found his voice, said, Please, let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. <laughs> you know, there are at least two ways to look at Elisha's request. One is to say, right on. And the Holy Spirit is what's needed here, given what the transaction that's about to take place here. There is a second way, though. And I confess, this was the way that I, I read it for many years. Uh, I remember being back in high school, reading this story, and like, where did that come from? Because it sounds like, Elijah, you're the biggest shot of them all. I will be twice as big as you were. Almost sounds a little greedy, doesn't it? Make me twice the man that you were for God? You know? I think there's a good explanation for the reason why Elisha asks for what he does. You see, he's not being greedy. In Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 17, we're not going to look there right now, but if you wish to look that up, you will find the very same phrase that's used here in 2 Kings chapter 2, where he says, give me that double portion. And in Deuteronomy chapter 21, it is used in a very specific context. Deuteronomy 21 is talking about the rules for distributing the inheritance of a father to the eldest son. If there are multiple heirs, the eldest son was to receive a double portion of the inheritance from the father. Now, yes, there was some status that was attached to this. That is true. But make no mistake, the responsibility was huge because the eldest son was considered to be the anchor for the family's ongoing reputation. If there was to be a, a, a legacy of dignity and honor and respect of following the Lord, it fell on the eldest son more than anyone else to make sure that happened. But the father passed away, therefore, the eldest son would be given not a single portion but a double portion for the very practical reason that he had to carry on the affairs of the estate more than anybody else. And that took resources. That took people. If there were servants involved, if there were cattle or animals, or, all of that would need to be sufficiently at the eldest son's disposal so he could do what he was called to do. And so Elisha is simply looking at his spiritual father and saying, please, if you must go, Leave me as your spiritual son, your eldest spiritual son, and give me the blessing that I will need to carry on this legacy, this calling that you are passing on to me. Give me what I need to get this job done. And the next part of the story doesn't quite seem to jive. Because the very next thing that Elijah says is what? What does it say? You have asked a hard thing. 
It, well, it, it, that's not what the spiritual father is supposed to say. say. Oh, well done, my son in the faith. You've done a great job in there. And say, so what does he say? Oh, that's a tough one. Oh, boy, don't know if I can pull that thing off. How, uh, how are we going to pull that? In fact, he even puts conditions on it here. What does he say? Uh, he says, uh, uh, you have asked uh, a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall not be so. Is it hard for God to give his spirit? I don't think there's any committees he has to run that through. I think it's pretty much a solitary decision. He can take care of that, just like that. What is Elijah saying here? You know, I think, there's, I think there's two possibilities. I think first, Elijah may just be pointing out the fact that he is not the one who qualifies those who are called for ministry. That is God's job. Elisha asks for a double portion of his spirit. And this, this is not a humanistic thing. He's clearly speaking about the spirit of God. Well, Elijah knows he can't do that. Only God is the one who gives this mantle of ministry. He's the only one that empowers it to be effective for him. It's not a human construct. And be careful, those of you that become mentors, whether you're a teen mentoring a, a, a second grader, or whether you're a 70 years old mentoring somebody who's in college. Never make the mistake of thinking that you are the one they need to look to ultimately. That's Jesus Christ's job. He is the one who grants the power and the strength in his spirit, not you. We simply get to be the messengers. That might be what Elijah is pointing to here. In other words, he's saying, I can't give it to you myself. That's, that's a difficult thing. I can't do that. But if you're here when God himself comes by, he can give it to you. And there is a second option. And this one I think is important. Could it be that on the cusp of being parted, where Elisha will no longer see his mentor, at least in that lifetime, could it be that Elijah is simply pointing out that ministry, that faith, that walking with and for God is sometimes really hard. Could it be that when Elisha said, give me a double portion of your spirit, that Elijah for just a moment is caught back in time and remembers when the Spirit of God came upon him and what that led him into? Great victories? Oh yes. Oh yes. Great challenges? Oh yes. Oh yes. You know, maybe it's always been the case. Maybe it's just been within the last four or five decades. I don't know. But too often I will hear people, specifically that are speaking to groups of young people. Maybe it's a, 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 you know, a, a large gathering somewhere in the nation and, and youth or young adults will gather together and there will be a well-intended, sincere speaker that will say something like this. Just give God a, a little opening and he'll take care of the rest in your life. All, all you need to do is just a, you know, a smidgen of faith and, and he'll take care of all the rest. And you know what? The entrance into the Christian life may well be described accurately in those terms. It is true. You cannot work your way into the kingdom of God. It's a gift of Jesus Christ. Of course it is. And if you think that it's all just easy, breezy, cruising downhill after that, you're in for a rough ride. Because you see, Jesus will take us just as we are. Absolutely. And he loves us too much to leave us there. And so he's going to take us on the ride of our lives. And sometimes it's going to cost. And I think when we soft pedal the Christian faith and ministry to young people, we say, oh, it's a piece of cake, just give a little. I think what happens, there's two things that can happen. Neither one of them are any good. One, the first, the, the first group of, uh, of young people, the first time that they hit a major snag in ministry, they bail out. Now, this isn't what the guy said. This isn't what the speaker said. This isn't what I signed up for. This isn't supposed to be hard. And so they bail. And then there's a second group. There's a second group of young people that understand that when we talk about God, we're talking about everything. We are talking about committing every last ounce of who we are to the work of Jesus Christ. And it will take everything that we have. And there are young people that know that if it's really worth doing, it will demand of them everything they have. And if they're in a church that doesn't demand that of them, they will go someplace else that will demand it of them. Because they know if it's real, if it's really involving God, 
then it must also involve all of them. And sometimes that's going to mean war. The fact of the matter is, is that in Christian ministry there are great joys, there are great triumphs to be had, no doubt about it. And in the end, God wins and we will go with him. But along the way there are going to be times when the price is sky high and it will take everything that we have laid on the altar before Jesus Christ. And I can't help but wonder if Elijah is just looking one last time at Elisha and saying, you've asked for the right thing. You're going to carry on where I've left off. And God is going to give you his spirit. And be careful, because it's going to cost you. It's worth it. Do it. And it's going to cost you. We need to be honest when we talk about the cost. Because things that are of true value, eternal value, will take all that we are. The conversation continues. I wish that we could, I wish we had on record even the small talk, whatever it was that was being said between them, but we don't. At last, though, the conversation comes to an end. And this is what we find in verse 11. Then it happened, as they continued on and talked, that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it, and he cried out, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and its horsemen. So he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and tore them into two pieces. <laughs> How do you describe this scene? I, mean, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't know how you do it. M many an artist ha has made an attempt to do this. Uh, Fred Collins was a, a longtime uh, illustrator for the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And uh, this, this picture here that he's painted, I give him credit. I mean, how do you, how, what, what does a chariot made of fire look like? I have no idea. What horses that are made of fire look like? I have no idea. Uh, here you, you, you see this representation here. The, 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 this chariot of fire comes down and e Elisha is there watching and seeing this. And apparently, this, this is just astonishing to think about it. Uh, Apparently, the fiery chariot comes so close. I mean, they're walking side by side. This is not a time when Elijah and Elisha are 20 feet apart, you know, playing football or something. They're they right shoulder to shoulder. And the chariot comes down so close, and heaven brushes Elisha and picks up Elijah, and up, up he goes. I have no idea what I would say under those circumstances. I have no idea. And it kind of sounds almost like Elisha isn't sure either. I mean, the, the first thing he realizes is, is Elijah is on his way. He's leaving him. My father, my father. And then apparently overwhelmed by the glory of God. I mean, you understand the symbolism here? A chariot is used as a symbol of God's might and power many times in the Old Testament. If there is an enemy that has oppressed God's people and God's patience is finally done and he goes in and he says, I am now going to avenge for my people. He's often symbolized as coming down in this mighty chariot thundering through the skies. And now Elisha sees it with his own two eyes. The horseman and the chariot of Israel. God himself has come by. And this part of the story ends in what is, it's the most puzzling way. Because it says that he took his clothes and he ripped them in two. You say, well, that's, that's no great mystery, Shane. Uh, uh, even today, uh, in, in, in that part of the world, if someone is really upset, they'll tear their clothes. They'll put you know, the, the whole idea of sackcloth and ashes, dust on their heads, you know, symbolizing tr tr tremendous grief. You know, that could be part of it here could be part of it. He, he doesn't know what to do. He's overwhelmed with emotion. His, his spiritual father is being taken away and he rips his clothes in two. It might be anguish or maybe he's getting ready for a new wardrobe. And when you have a new wardrobe you don't need the old one says, verse 13, he also took up 
the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water and said, and I think he said it with confidence, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also had struck the water, it was divided this way and that, and Elisha crossed over. Now when the sons of the prophets who were from Jericho saw him, they said, The spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. The mantle had been passed to the next generation. And by the way, did you know that this mantle was no stranger to Elisha? This is not the first time that he had worn it. If we had the time, we might look back at 1 Kings chapter 19, where there is a story of an old prophet named Elijah, who was in the final years of his ministry, and the Lord revealed to him, it's time for you to find a successor, one of my choosing. And he showed him the family farm of a young man named Elisha. And Elisha was out in the field, the Bible tells us, plowing with the oxen. And Elijah comes up and without saying a word, takes off his mantle and puts it on the shoulders of Elisha. And the first words out of Elijah's mouth. What have I done to you? In other words, do you understand what this mantle means? And for the next many years, Elijah teaches Elisha, mantling him bit by bit by bit, teaching him this, showing him that, entrusting him with this responsibility, and letting him go, making errors, helping to correct them. And finally the day comes when the mantle is passed, and Elisha now has sole possession of that mantle. Elisha would go on to have one of the most fruitful ministries in all of the Old Testament. There are few people that God used more than Elisha. And as we look at his life and we see the miracles that were wrought, the kings that were successfully faced, the idolatry that was successfully taken away, the witness for God that was successfully given, we are forced to draw a hard and fast conclusion. It never would have happened except someone who was older and more experienced in the faith took under their wing someone who was younger and less experienced in the faith. That's where Elisha and the results from his ministry came from. Someone passed the mantle on. I have good news for you. As old as this story is, these things still happen today. God is still in the business of looking for people that will take the mantle that's been given to them and pass it on in big ways and small to those of less experience. He's still looking for people to do that and when it happens, it's a powerful thing. In fact, to prove the point, I'd like to invite Gary Patterson to come and to join me here this morning. Gary is, of course, a member here of our church. He and his wife, Ray, are longtime parts of the New Market family. Gary is also a longtime denominational worker at the General Conference, the North American Division Conference, and as a pastor. Gary, you have a story that you shared with me recently about passing this mantle, and I'd like you to share it with us, please, now. I should tell you at the outset, it is not easy for me to relate this experience to you. So you should know I'll probably break down somewhere in the middle of it. Just warned you in advance. My father was born in 1910 in a little town of Addy, Washington, which is just a few miles out of Spokane, a farming community where he was born. And he grew up there and in the surrounding area in this farming community. As he did so, he developed the skills of a young farmer and he would get up in the morning before breakfast and milk a herd of over 20 cows by hand. 
My dad's hands were huge, big fingers, powerful hands. But as he grew, he felt a call to ministry, and he went to Walla Walla College, where both Pastor Shane and I went many years later. Graduated in 1935 and went into ministry in the state of Oregon. He made himself well known there as a strong pastoral ministry. And if I remember correctly, he baptized you. Oh, well. Years later, we worked together. Ministry that continued on. As his ministry came to a close, he retired and actually spent his last years in the state of Florida. He died just 10 years ago. When he came to the latter part of his life, he was blessed with a mind that was still sharp and accurate to the very end. Charlotte, don't cry. You're going to get me. <laughs> His mind was still sharp and accurate to the very end. I'm going to look this direction. <laughs> but he was also taken with the disease Parkinson's. And it began with the trembling and the shaking, but it got to the place to where the last days of his life, though his mind was still sharp, he lost his ability to swallow. And he said, don't make medical heroics for me. I've had a good life and ministry. Don't do things to prolong my life. Just let me go. And I would try to help him. I would take a straw and I would dip it in his glass of water, ice water, and to help his parched mouth and throat, I would put my thumb over the end of the straw and just drop little drops of water into his mouth. And he would choke on that little bit of water. So he lost his ability to speak, he lost his ability to move, and he was transferred each day those last few days from his bed in the morning, the aides would come in and they would move him to a large recliner type chair and in the evening they would move him back to the bed because he was not able to move or to speak. I called my son Jeff, who many of you know, who is a graduate of this school and institution here, and I said, Jeff, Grandpa is not going to live long just want you to know, and he said, I need to see Grandpa once more before he passes. And it was a family thing, Dad in the ministry and myself in the ministry and my son in the ministry, who now pastors the Forest Lake Church in Florida. He jumped on a plane, came down to Florida, and Dad had decided to give his preaching Bible for those of you who don't understand exactly what that is, ministers have lots of Bibles. Uh, this, chain seems to be the preaching Bible. You have many others. Dad's preaching Bible that was well-worn and well-marked. And that was to go to Jeff. We gave him that the day that he arrived. The next morning he came in to see Dad. And he had taken the Bible and he had found certain selected texts that Dad had marked in the Bible. He pulled up a chair in front of Dad reclining there in the seat, unable to talk, unable to move. And he said, Grandpa, I want to read you texts from your Bible. And he began to read and he read... <clears throat> Finally, he came to the Tim Timothy text, and this is the one that gets me. I have fought a good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is treasure laid up for me in heaven, and not for me only, but for all those also who love is appearing. Amen. At the close of... Just a minute. At the close of reading that text, Jeff was overcome with emotion. 
He bent forward toward Dad and began to sob. Then the miracle happened. Dad, who had not been able to talk, not been able to move, rose up out of his chair, placed his hand on the head of his grandson, and began to pray in that clear, powerful voice that he had used through his years of ministry. And he passed the mantle. For two or three minutes he prayed in this powerful voice. And when he was done, he slumped back into his chair, and as far as we know, never spoke another word till he closed his eyes in sleep, waiting for the coming of the Lord. Well, we say, why don't we see things like Elisha saw? The chariot of the Lord and the horsemen, the fiery chariot. And then I thought to myself, what is the next thing that Dad sees? He sees the chariots of the Lord, not just one, come for Elisha, but thousands of them when Jesus comes. Amen. The heaven will be filled with it. Passing of the mantle is a God thing. It is accompanied by the miraculous. You may not always see it, but it is always there. Because it is not something you do. It is something that God does through you. Amen. 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 God is calling us to participate in the miraculous when he asks us to pass the mantle of the faith on to the next generation. In just a few days there will be people here that will be playing the role of Elisha and many, many of you, the Lord will be looking for you to be Elijah. Perhaps it will simply be a matter of you being aware of the people that God brings to you in a moment. From minute to minute, maybe they're sitting next to you now. You need to say hello. I'm so-and-so. Who are you? Maybe it means you become a rock friend. That's what Rock Ministries is for, is to help to pass the mantle on to the next generation. And for those of you that are leaders, maybe it's simply a matter of saying, you know what, it's time that I took this seriously. I'm not going to do ministry anymore just with a single generation. I'm going to instead bring in others that we might get to know one another, that we might minister together, and that, yes, the mantle might be successfully passed on to the next generation. Who will your Elisha be this year? Who will you pass the mantle of the faith and ministry to this school year? Jesus, indeed, we want to commit ourselves to you, Lord. Take all of us, Lord. We stand here on the cusp of a brand new school year. There are opportunities, Lord, dozens and dozens, hundreds of them, Lord, of opportunities to be able to share our faith, Lord, and not just merely with the idea of it being a momentary thing, but with the idea that it will be a passing of the mantle. Lord, the church has always been just one generation away from extinction. It's always been that way. I pray, Lord, that here, that we would not merely pass on keys to cars and other interesting things, but that we would pass on the most important thing of all, that we would pass the mantle of faith and ministry on to the next generation. Bless us, Lord, that we might accomplish this. By your grace and in your name we pray. Amen.